This is an unfinished winter scene I've been working on and when I was painting it the other night I really had a good time working on these snow covered trees and the trees are dark because they're backlit the sun is just rising in the scene and uh, so everything that should be white in our minds is actually still a, sh a tinge of blue because we really don't have a lot of light yet at this time of morning. So what I'd like to do is demonstrate to you how I painted this and we'll go a little further and finish this scene as well. So let's just get started. And I'm using a 9 by 12 Arches watercolor paper. This is the cold press. And uh, my trusty uh, number 10 Escoda Versatil Rigger brush. And I love this brush. Uh, ordinarily I think when people are painting something this size and getting started you're probably thinking about using a big flat brush but you really don't have to. This is almost the only brush I use because it works so well for almost everything. And I'm going to just start by painting my, my, my snow, my lightest snow, which is the snow that we see on our trees. So we're just going to start with a wash to organize our sky. And we're going to start just by putting our horizon in with clear water. And that clear water is going to give us our horizon. It's also going to give us a nice barrier between the dry paper on the lower part of the horizon and the moist. Oops, and I keep picking up a little bit of ex excess pigment, um, pigment powder that's floating around. So for my sky, I'm going to use Rose Matter Lake. And just add a touch of that into that wet line that I've placed and it's going to lighten as I move my brush across the paper so I don't have to feel like a uh, panic if it looks too dark with that first brush stroke and then I'm going to add some yellow uh, this is lemon yellow and that's going to go at the base of my horizon here to mingle with the rose matter and give us a bit of an orange. And if they're not flowing the way you think they should at this early stage, just a little bead of water added here will give them some movement. And I put too much there, you can see it making a little uh, <laughs> standing out, flowing faster than everything else. And um, I'm not going to worry about that too much because I can always place a tree there. And I think it will even out in the end. Okay, so while that's nice and moist, let's grab some blue and we'll make our, the rest of our sky. And for this I'm using French Cerulean. And just straight from the palette. Make sure you don't pick up a chunk of pigment on your brush when you're placing pure color from your palette. You want to make sure you have just an inky kind of consistency of pigment. And that's pretty light at this stage. So now I can grab a little, but now that it's evenly moist, I can grab a little bit more and darken it up a little bit. And according to my reference photo, there is, you know, it, it's not even all the way across. It is actually a little bit darker, kind of toward the top, a little bit muddier. And for muddy color, often what I do instead of mixing something pure is just gra grab a little bit of dirty um, pigment from somewhere else in my palette. I have kind of a muddy violet on my palette that hasn't been cleaned up from a previous session so I can use that. So there is my sky. I still see quite a line between my blue and my pink so I think I want to tweak with that a little bit. When everything's shiny, moist, fully saturated, you can work it a little bit. I still try to use a very light touch. And notice that rush of pigment that we had there, the rush of water, it's kind of faded away. It still has some variation in color, but I think that's kind of pleasing. Now at this stage, we know that our trees at the background are going to be darker, and so we want uh, so we can cover up the pink that we have here, but I actually do want to lighten it a little bit because as, although the trees are overall dark, they also have that lighter color of snow. Um, they do have snow on the branches that is not going to look good if it's pink. So let's just lift some color 
to show where our tree our tree line is going to go. And I'm just using paper towel for that. And I think I'm also going to lift out color where my large trees are going to go at the side of my painting. So that's right here. And maybe one right here. And by blotting that color, you remove not just the color, but you remove some moisture, which is going to slow that movement of pigment in those areas. So anytime you're blotting, you're going to slow down whatever um, is happening around it. You're going to start to create that barrier that we get uh, with dry paper against white, uh, wet paper. It's still going to bleed a little bit because it's not completely dry, so that's going to give us kind of a soft effect, that which, which is a good thing. Uh, at this stage now, we want to let things dry. My first sky layer has dried. As you can see, the areas that I blotted have created a little bit of a dimpled edge here, just a little bit jaggedy, and that's where that moist pigment met that drier paper and it, it does tend to bleed a little bit that's why the edge is so irregular and maybe you're thinking to yourself why wouldn't you just paint your sky around the darker tree areas but I like that when I paint this way when I paint the color and then lift or, or soften another way you can do it is to lift and then soften those edges but then you get a much more delicate transition. It's, there aren't nearly as many crisp lines as you would have if you were painting around all of those trees. When you blot this way, you get a much softer edge and it's a much more gradual transition so I don't have to worry about meeting those white spaces between the, the jagged lines. Right now, our next step here is to paint our snow, our lighter areas down below here. So we're going to be painting uh, not just the snow on the trees, but we're going to be painting pretty much all the snow in the landscape. So I'm just going to paint my tree shapes in a lighter blue. And this is the French cerulean that I used in my sky, with just a little bit slightly, a little darker um, proportion here, value mixture. And I'm actually painting the entire tree with that color. And this is where I get to fill in those blotted spaces. And you can overlap them a little bit, it doesn't hurt anything. And not all of my tree is going to stay this color, but this is going to be the, the lightest color, the snow on my tree. So um, I'm going to keep the top part of the branch soft, like a big heavy load of snow. There's actually a tree over here too. I should have blotted a little bit more there. Again, it's that half inch that really doesn't matter that much. And I'm going to actually use some water to flow downward to cover my land as well. And pull that blue across the page. And you notice I tilted my board up. I like having that gravity help me out there with the color flowing down the page. And my landscape, my horizon line is still right about there. But there's this tree in front of it. And I've dripped some water. Sometimes that water will lift the sky, so you want to blot it up right away if you have a drip of water on a dry wash. Depending on the, the paint that you use, some paints will re-wet and then be easily lifted. We don't want that to happen. So you can see my tree, it's almost like we're painting the silhouettes of the trees right now. And uh, I use that line as a marker to tell me where my horizon is. But then I need some water to kind of flow it away. I don't want to have a crisp line there. Because my tree goes in front of that background landscape stuff. Okay, so right now we have this unresolved area, this uh, snow on the land and snow on the tree. We're not, we don't have to worry about that right now. The nice thing about painting the lightest areas is that you know you can go, you'll, you'll be going darker over the parts that need to be dark. So you're mainly just painting to fill that space to serve as a marker. And then later you get to go back in and add the 
darker values that make the shapes resolve themselves, make those shapes work. Now, I'm, you can see I'm not being very tidy here, and that's because most of these trees are actually very dark. They're silhouetted against the, the sunrise, and so all of this is serving as a placeholder just until I can get those darks positioned, which is going to happen right about now. And for this, I'm going to use Sodalite Genu Genuine. And Sodalite is a really fun color. If you don't have it, you might consider using Payne's Gray. And I'm going to mix it in my palette with a little bit of the French Cerulean. I'm not going to go too dark too fast. And the Sodalite is going to give me the tops of my trees. You can see I'm giving them little points, spiky evergreen trees. And I'm going to probably need to adjust my board in a minute. I don't want too much gravity pulling those darker hues down. Uh, one way to make those little points is pulling up. If I go this way, they, they tend to be a little bit fatter at the top, the trees. And if you flick upwards, you'll get a nicer little point. And keep going across. And I'm just kind of making an irregular line here in that diluted sodalite genuine color. These trees in the background are not the main event. They are not the star of the show. So we do not want to spend too much time working out those details. Then we want them to seem kind of frost touched. Now I'm going to grab some pure sodalite. And my painting right now, it's damp, but it's not super juicy, so that means the color is only going to move so much. I have a little bit of control over how much that color bleeds. So I can work on those silhouettes that have tops of the trees are going to look darker with the sunrise behind them. And then they get a little lighter down below. And I might decide to put some shadows in where they touch the ground. I have to decide that, and I have time to do that yet. And uh, if you want to fill an area a little bit faster, and I think some of these lines look a little too regular, so I'm just going to use the side of my brush and pull up a little bit here. And that's just going to blend some of those colors together a little bit. So by working in these stages, by not painting the darkest color immediately, I give myself a little bit of breathing room and a little margin for error. And I'm going to blot again. I want to slow the advance of this. I'm getting kind of a bleed here. I'm going to slow that down by lifting moisture and color. And then I can resolve any kind of weak areas. Once this has dried, I'll have a little bit more freedom to add some darks. Now, moving back over to these trees, I want to put the darks in right now. And I think we're going to have fun doing it. First thing I'm going to do, I think, is going to build is to build up some of those, some of that snow a little bit more. I want a little more rich blue because um, I just want these trees to stand out. And I think by exaggerating the blue shadows on the snow, I think that's going to work really well. And that's a tool an artist artists frequently use is exaggeration. Taking those, the things we see, and doing them, just pushing the, pushing the contrasts a little bit more, we get to make a little bit more of a statement. And uh, that gives us, makes our message to our viewers sometimes stronger. You want to be careful you don't push it so hard it becomes cartoonish although that can be a thing too there's no wrong there's no limit to you know how you exaggerate stuff that's where pop art came from those exaggerations and I'm kind of just imagining where snow would be we know snow is going to sit on the tops of the branches and uh, we know too that the rest of the tree is going to be darker than that blue snow so I can paint more snow than I am actually going to have in my finished painting 
So again, I'm still painting the trees and the silhouette of the trees. And that one's very blue. But again, we, that one might be cropped out completely in the finished painting. We'll see. Now as that is nice and moist, we're going to grab our soda light and do a little bit of blending. I want some softness to this. And you can have... I have painted trees with snow with some fairly crisp contrasts, but I really like this effect of... And that's a little bit too bright or too dark. I really like this effect of putting my dark tree branches under the snow. That's where they're going to be. But doing it while the snow is snow color is wet so that I get some blending and bleeding. And that gives a more painterly effect, I think. So now remember that anywhere this soda light goes, that's going to be my dark tree branch. And I'm going to try to just paint underneath my snow at this point. So let's just go for those branches that are peeking out from the snow. And I do have a lot of sodalite on my brush. Sodalite does tend to dry a little lighter than you see it. Uh, then it goes on. Quite a bit lighter actually. And as I paint, you know, I have less and less paint on my brush. So it gets lighter as I move along. And then if I need to, I can always use a brush or a paper towel to soak up some of that excess color. So right now the priority is just on looking for that underneath. I'm painting underneath the snow I painted, but also right into it. Like I'm not just going, well, I can't touch that because it has, you know, blue snow. Uh, if it's a good place to put a dark value, I can work it right in there. And that's the advantage of doing it wet and wet like this, is you get that bleeding. There's some really neat little spiky branch feeling happening because that soda light is bleeding into the blue that I've already placed on the paper. And I think that looks really much like a snow-covered tree early in the morning when everything is still fairly dark and the colors, all the, all the colors are in shadow right now. When you're painting uh, with limited light, if it's night or there's not a lot of sunlight, then the colors are going to be less saturated. In, in shadow, everything is dark. You don't see a lot of differentiating in color. And so we get to use a more minimal palette. And that's why we've kept our colors fairly limited. How much blue you leave is going to tell us how much snow there is, how, how much fresh snow is on the, on the trees. This one in the background is behind the others, so it's going to be a little less distinct, with less detail, and that will help keep it in the background as a less important element in our painting. Um, almost done. Almost at the stage where we're going to let it dry. Just adding a little bit of blue to a couple places here. I want some snow. I oh, need a little bit less paint and a little bit more water. Just making adjustments that make everything hopefully work. And it's a little bit gimmicky. Sometimes if you have an area that's kind of not working right, right, you just need to balance it out by making another kind of similar area somewhere else, somewhere where those same elements kind of dominate. So if I have a real strong dark here, I might need to put more strong darks on this side. And I think I've kind of already done that. Okay, so we're going to give this a pause again, let it dry, and then we'll come back and look at it one more time and add a few more details. We are really trying to keep this to a simple landscape scene. What I really wanted to show you today was just uh, this technique of painting these snow-covered trees. And as you can see, it's it's not a complicated process. You're thinking in terms of snow and then the, and then the trees underneath. And by painting it 
wet and wet, we get a really nice softness to it. What I'm seeing where the trees meet the snow uh, is that there's some kind of frosty bushes there that can be this whiter area, but then I might want to actually define the snow with a little bit of a darker blue, and of course that's too dark. And I usually try to put color down a little bit darker than it needs to be. Then I have some paint that I can pull across the page. So without waiting too long, because you don't want it to soak in and stain, create a line, I can pull that line down and I think I want to soften it even a little bit more. So just using my brush, move some of that pigment, lightly lifting, lightly pulling it down. And that will give me a bit of a line for my landscape. I'm gonna do a little bit more up there yet. And I'm also going to give myself a, a line here to show the contours of the land. And these lines give you the clues you need to show where where things are placed in the scene. And I'm softening most of it away because I'm wondering if it should actually be positioned a little bit differently. We actually have quite a bit of um, shadow kind of along in here. Remember that the light is the sun is coming up behind these trees. So there, if there are any shadows, darker areas, they're going to be on this side of the trees coming toward the viewer. And I think that actually kind of works. And painting snow is a really good way to understand the contours of the land because it really gives us, uh, the shadows on the snow give us those clues that we need to see the way the land moves and the places where it rises and falls. One thing that could help us ground our scene right now is to just take a bit of a neutral color and because we haven't really used, I mean, we've used pink and we've used blue in our painting and we did use a little bit of yellow. So I'm going to use the same yellow and I'm going to mix it with a little bit of the blue and a little bit of that pink. And you want to, when you're mixing and adding a new color, it's not really going to be a new color because I'm borrowing from those initial primaries that I used. So I'm taking the colors that I already used to make my neutral. And by combining those three, I get myself a brown. And that I can use in here to give myself some maybe little weeds poking out of the snow. And those grayish shadows in the snow are going to indicate, you know, something under the snow. And I'm going to move that right across um, and then do some grasses over here and actually by pulling up into this place where things are kind of moist I might get the feeling of some bushes which is very accurate to what I'm seeing in my reference photo and again when you're looking at a reference photo you have to decide well, the, everything you put in needs to support the focal point so I don't want to put in all of those bushes and become so busy over here that it distracts from what's going on over here but a little bit might just be the detail that we need to move across through our painting and then the other thing I'm going to do is work on my trees back here and I'm going to grab the soda light for that and get some of those dark trees and I want these trees to be really the darkest and most contrasting part of my painting and I'm not going to do anything else to them I'm not going to add any more detail I like to think I know when to leave well enough alone and I feel like they kind of say all they need to say so I'm going to add some darks in here though just to give this a little bit more of a finished look kind of eyeing up what's happening in my reference photo and there's kind of some trees that are in the foreground that are a little darker and it's kind of blending in there and I think that's okay I could blot around around it and then build up the shape a little bit more it's not too late to change my plan there. So I'm going to go back and touch that again when it's dry. 
and I think a little bit of dark. The deal is a few darks scattered here and there just kind of moves the eye through the painting and it gives a third, like another layer of complexity to your scene. And in this case, when you have, when you're painting groups of trees, you know, there's going to be layers. There's going to be the trees in the front, which are often either the darkest or lightest value, depending on the way the light is falling and what kind of trees they are. And then there's, you know, the trees that are more distant, looking through those trees to the trees beyond the, there. So you kind of have to think um, of a way to suggest those layers, those levels. And I like to just kind of scatter a few darks to give us some depths. And I think that's working just a little bit better. I can also add a little bit of darks in here to help define the shape of the tree in front. And just by painting kind of around, imagining a branch and then painting around it, now this tree pops forward just a little bit more in that spot. Place those darks and then soften them as we move away from the tree. And that works. It, you can't even tell that I did that after. I want things to seem fuzzy and indistinct. It's not very light out yet in the morning, so that means we have, uh, it's harder to see details. And that tree probably shouldn't be alone. It might look better if it's balanced out by a friend. And you know what? If this tree was in front of all these others, it's going to be lower on the picture plane as well. So it might even be down here. And because this kind of suggests this blue line, it kind of suggests uh, the crest of a, of a little bit of a rise. So that doesn't always apply that this tree needs to overlap with that blue line. I could have probably not um, put the bottom of the tree as being visible, but I did. And I think to, just to give us the balance in this painting, and we're, we're, we have now two, well, actually three trees over here, uh, two here bunched in that cluster, and we could maybe place one more over here just to give us uh, a little bit more of a balanced dynamic. I think it'll work. And it's going to blend in a little bit with the dark background, which is good because we don't want it to take prominence in the painting. Now I'm wondering about my French cerulean. If I touch a little bit into this wet sodalite wash, is it going to do the blue snow effect or is it just going to add a little bit more darkness to it? Sometimes when you are wondering something, you just have to try it. If, it's, uh, if you choose a color that's a little bit opaque, then you can layer it over darker values and get a whole new effect than if you were putting it over white paper. And I like that. I like that little extra bit of color in those, in those spots. Okay, so it's time to stop and... It's really, and I say it's time to stop for two reasons. Uh, one is that it's, it is really easy to overwork a painting, like I've said. And another is that the painting, the reference photo will never say stop to you. There's always one more detail, one more little thing you want to add, one more thing you see in it. Because what we do is we, we, get, a mag we get this magnifying glass vision where we look at our reference photo, um, we try to get those major shapes, and then every time we go back into our painting, we're zeroing in on more detail and further detail and further detail. So it's very easy to overwork a painting just because you're you're examining your reference photo so closely. 
really what I wanted you to take away from this is just to remember that white isn't always white. When we're painting, especially in low light like this, you know, the shadows, uh, it changes everything. And there actually is no, not really any white at all in this painting, um, aside from a few flecks here. And even then, I think I pulled uh, the blue right across the page. And what we're seeing as white is really just the palest wash of blue. Um, it's still comes down to the basic watercolor principles that contrast and strong value contrasts are going to make your painting more dynamic. And it's those darks and lights in contrast with each other, in harmony with each other, that move your eye through the painting and give your painting this beautiful dynamic. If you enjoyed this video, you're going to love my online school. At learn.angelafair.com, I have hundreds of hours of video content, watercolor knowledge aimed to help you grow your skills and find your sweet spot of self-expression. Enroll today. That's learn.angelafair.com.